Michael Woodard Jr. is our presenter today, and he's currently the Associate Director for Recruitment and Admissions here at Barry University. He does some student teaching in the Adrian Dominican School of Education, which means he's the professors there are allowing him to teach some courses. He is a PhD student in curriculum and instruction with emphasis in reading, literacy, and cognition. And he is currently in the process of writing his proposal for his dissertation. He is a, Michael is a former teacher. He was inspired while surrounded by his scholars as they struggled to find fiction literature reflecting their lives. He writes stories that are representative of the hundreds of thousands of children who come from low-income communities and face inequities that many adults may never have to encounter. Welcome everyone. And um, let's listen to Michael Woodard Jr. Thank you. All right, sounds good. Can, can everybody hear me? Can I get a thumbs up, Dr. Scott or Dr. Van? Can you hear me? All right, you can see my screen. Everyone can see my screen in presenter view. In presenter view. So without further ado, uh, let's get this party started. I'm just so incredibly excited, so incredibly privileged uh, to be able to have this moment in front of you all, to be a part of this symposium. Uh, there are literally hundreds of sessions happening right now. So to just be able to have a small piece of this moment in time for the university, it means so much to me. What it is that I chose to do this presentation on is something that means so much to me. Uh, it's much more than a few of the books that I read or a few of the experiences that I share with other people, more particularly with children. But this is something that I truly believe in. This is something that I understand has the fundamental intent to change the narrative in so many low-income communities. Um, but I'd rather show you rather than tell you. Um, so I think with life, it all begins with a journey. And I want to take you all back just for a moment uh, to, to show where we began and to show how far we have come. So the title of my presentation is Purpose and Empowerment a critical analysis on multicultural children's literature. Before we jump in, I just want you to take a moment. Really take a moment. You can close your eyes, you can keep them open. I know y'all got your cameras off, so it's perfectly fine, but I want you to think back to a time when you were read to. Think back to your childhood. Think back to whether sitting on your father's knee or your mother's knee or sitting on the classroom rug in your elementary class. Think of your favorite story. Ask yourself, what was the setting? What was the, who was the main character? Also ask yourself, did you feel included within the text? What about the illustrations? Ask yourself, was the color, was the character or main person, the main character or person of color? Or was the setting of the Asian American Pacific Island, African or the Latin American diaspora? These are some of the questions we probably wouldn't ask ourselves or children wouldn't explicitly ask themselves. But I do believe that through children's literature, a number of these ideologies are embedded. And it is up to us to open the door and show multicultural children's literature. This is a real picture. This is a school in DC where they do mindfulness. And they sit children down, they really have them reflect. And it's something that I thought was so fitting to this moment. You go over your eyes, you come back to reality. You, well, <laughs> you can come back a little further down the reality spectrum than where we were for some of us a few years ago, for some of us just a little bit longer ago. And that's okay. My name is Michael Woodward Jr. I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a children's author, um, social director of recruitment and admissions. But more importantly, I'm a scholar. And I'm someone that I understand that every day we must get better. But not only within our own minds, but within the minds of others. I travel the country and I go to different elementary, middle schools, 
Uh, my job sends me to high schools, but I always find a way to find myself into a classroom. And whether I'm reading one of my favorite books or whether I'm holding an incredibly tough conversation, I understand that children of color will continue to infiltrate the hearts and minds of those, whether they like it or not. So let's get back to the essence of multicultural children's literature and the impact that it has. I don't want to read to you, but Dr. Tyrone Howard talks about liberation and he talks about the purpose of literature and he talks about the purpose of authentic multicultural literature is here to help us all from these preconceived stereotypical hangups that imprison us. Unfortunately, the more we go down this road throughout the absence of multicultural literature, the more this, 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 veil, of <laughs> this veil of invisibility says loudly to children, you don't count, you don't matter. So the more we exclude them, the more many of them will come to the realization that they just don't feel champion. Some of the quick key facts of what multicultural literature stands for, and it's heightening the respect for all individuals, acknowledging the contributions of minorities, and bringing children into contact with other cultures. We'll go a lot deeper in that in just a moment. So before we talk about the present day and my research study, let's go back to that journey. And let's really look behind the curtain and let's take a look at what childhood through the centuries looks like. You know, children had it really, really tough growing up. And we're talking about over the centuries, throughout the Dark Ages, the Romanticism period, the Renaissance, all throughout history. It wasn't up until recently, a few centuries ago, where children were looked at as children. It's impressionable, young adults. Whereas in many cultures and throughout many centuries, Children were looked at as little people. And the moment they turned five, oh, it was time to get that free labor out of them. And this is what we see. And this played a part in their education and their cognitive development. So let's take it way, way back, way back to fourth century BC. Before we even started to see children's books, we heard them on the streets. We heard stories. We heard people gather crowds and stand on milk crates and, 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 and on the curbs of streets and tell fables and stories. Fast forward a couple hundred years, we get the, um, the medieval version of Desperate Housewives, the Canterbury Tales, that tells all of these stories of what life was like back then. However, a lot of these stories, nearly all of these stories were handwritten. And some of these artifacts actually still do exist to this day. But luckily, just a few years after the Canterbury release, we got, we've come across the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. And that just changed everything. And not just for children's literature, but we're talking about for the King James version of the Bible, we're talking about for newspaper and print. And the moment the printing press came about, life changed. I, did, I have a picture of the horn book, which was used as well uh, to teach students the alphabet, Puritan ways, the belief in religion. And it was actually soaked in cow horn and it was used so that it could last a long time. Remember, we didn't have hardcover books back then. So, but children still had to be taught some way or another, more particularly how to read. So as we continue down this journey of children's literature, we start to get a little bit closer in time periods. And when you look at the 16th century, we've got what's known as chat books. And chat books were these little tiny books that you can put in your pocket. They told tales of Jack, the giant slayer. They told stories of Mother Goose. They told all of these different stories and all these different nursery rhymes that we may not even have known existed so long ago. Well, fun fact, the clergy and the upper class, they, they couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand how the poor people had these chat books and they were able to socialize with one another. They move forward in time. So let's fast forward about 100 years or so. And we have what's known as Orbis Pictus. 
Orbis Pictus was the first picture book. It had over 150 illustrations and it taught children how to learn. And it was actually based in Latin. But throughout the years, it really survived the time and it shed a light on the importance of illustrations and text and how they came together as one. A little bit further on down the line, we've got the little pretty pocketbook. A little cute sounding book. This book was written by John Newberry. Some of you all may be like, I've heard that name. I know that name, I've heard that name before. That's the Newberry Award Medal. Well, John Newberry started out actually writing books and him and his family ultimately accrued over 4,000 of them. He created his own book, publishing house and he set the standard. And he was one of the first people to, I don't wanna say capitalize or monetize, but understand that that was an entire demographic that was not championed and not, I don't want to say being taken advantage of, but not being sold something or not having something created that was specifically for them. So now we got the New England, the New England Primer, which was actually written in, I believe, the 1700s, 1760. But it didn't really pick up until the 18th and 19th century. This book sold over 5 million copies. They sold it to schools all throughout London and all throughout America, and it taught children, again, letters and how to read and putting things together. So I think we're starting to see, how do you say, a trend in what's most important and what is needed for children as they grow. They need to be able to make these connections between reality and what is presented to them in text. Where the problem lies in is that everybody isn't represented in a sense. And I think we'll find out right here. We look at the 18th and 19th century and there are so many books that came about, so many books, so many beautiful, timeless classics. However, so many books that either A, misinterpreted other races or B, simply left them without. And that was a problem. That was a problem up until the progressivist era within the civil rights era in the 1950s and 60s. And you start to see people take a stance towards like, yo, I'm tired of being excluded. I'm tired of being thought less of. I'm sure people had thought this all their lives growing up, 17, 18, 19th century. But now we start to fight back. We started to raise some, kick up some dirt. And we see that in these protests. And we see that in the eyes of James Baldwin. Well, as a result of these inputs, it led us to some pretty stellar outcomes. Some, some beautiful pieces of literature that represented the ideologies and the faces of marginalized communities and black and brown children near and far. And I think that's incredible. It took long enough. However, have we reached this place? Like, have we reached this level of acceptability or satisfaction? Because this was nearly 40, 50 years ago. In the first book, I brought you all the way back to the 16th century. So it, it, it leads us to ask, have we arrived? And I can't answer that question, but I can find people who can.